All right, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, those of you who are here physically and those of you who are watching or will watch uh, online, we're delighted that you can be present and participate in this conversation on uh, the exploitation of labor in China and issues springing forth from that, the ethical and strategic. We have two distinguished experts from the Mercatus Center here to address this topic. Uh, but firstly, let me explain that uh, this event is uh, hosted by Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy. I am uh, Mark Tooley, uh, editor of uh, the journal and president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy. This is uh, one of a series of uh, talks that Providence hosts. Uh, typically, we have a purely uh, social get-together at least once a month, and then also a more formal presentation. Uh, next week, uh, we will not be having either, but instead we are hosting our annual Christianity and National Security Conference uh, here in DC, which is a day and a half of scholars uh, discussing faith and uh, uh, global statecraft. Uh, the event is not open to the public, uh, but uh, if you would like to be invited to attend, let me know. The target audience for it is students, professors, and young professionals in DC who are engaged uh, in these issues. So it's a wonderful event. Uh, it will be videoed, and those will be posted uh, afterwards. Uh, but uh, for this evening, uh, I confess I'm always impatient at Washington events when speakers are preceded by long introductions. <laughs> so we can all look up the uh, biographies ourselves. And of course, the speakers themselves know uh, their own biography much better than the introducer does. So rather than introducing anyone, I will just invite both of you to introduce yourselves, if you don't mind. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for hosting us. And thank you all for coming out tonight. It's really exciting to be here for the first time and, and uh, meet some of you. Um, so my name is Christine McDaniel. I'm a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. I am a trade economist. And my topics of uh, research interests are international trade, econometrics, and economic modeling, and globalization, and intellectual property rights. My name is Wei Feng Zhong. I'm also a senior research fellow at the Mercator Center. Uh, Christine and I work in a program we call International Freedom, which basically addresses the uh, trying to address the problem of how does the how could the United States engage with China in a way that doesn't harm our economic freedom or national security. Because that's a, a hard problem to solve. Um, we, we saw in the last 20 years, it's, we are overly emphasizing you know, cheap goods from China. And then now all these security issues are coming back to haunt us. And so this is the general area that we, uh, general area that we work in. And um, my personal research also touches upon, uh, upon monitoring Chinese propaganda, uh, building machine learning programs to read what the Communist Party says and make inferences about what they might do next. Uh, that's the, uh, what we call the Policy Change Index Project. So that's basically an outline of what we do. And thank you for coming to the event today. Well, uh, thank you. I'll just share or uh, throw at you a few uh, questions to get the conversation started, but you're more than welcome to take uh, your answers in any direction you choose, and then we'll go to the audience for uh, questions. Uh, but obviously what you both are addressing is tremendously topical and important right now. Uh, the rise of China in and of itself is hugely important for America and the world, uh, but the labor situation in China is certainly uh, central to these uh, challenges. Uh, if you had to summarize in three or four or five minutes, what is the problem and uh, what should America's response be, ideally? You want to go first? I want you. Okay. <laughs> so I, I think that the way we, uh, Christina and I both see the China challenge is that uh, China, uh, around the year 2000, when they joined the WTO, it opened up the economy. And that was the, sort of the step, step one of the engagement. But then after we engaged with China for 20 years in this way, mostly economic way, uh, we're exposing uh, ourselves, I'm talking about liberal democratic uh, societies, to the potential security interests that we did not anticipate. And I remember very distinctively, uh, I graduated in China um, uh, I went to college in China, so I graduated in 2006, and I very uh, distinctly remember back then that uh, people who negotiated the China's accession to the WTO were actually not popular in China, because pe Chinese people were thinking, 
uh, you know, they are like betraying our national interests, they're um, making too much concession to the United States. Yet, we joined the WTO because we wanted to be better. We wanted to reform our economy. We wanted to in reform our institutions. And that was the hope people, uh, uh, regular folks in China, had uh, in early 2000s. So neither the Chinese people nor the Western societies anticipated that things would turn out that way. But now things have turned out that way, meaning that our economies are so intertwined. We have goods uh, from China, possibly made with forced labor, and there's no, really a, no good way to verify it. And so now the uh, problem posed to the United States is how do you, how do you tackle this issue? You cannot just de decouple in, uh, with China completely because that would cause a lot of uh, dis economic destruction, uh, uh, disruption. Right? Just think about all these supply, quote unquote, supply chain challenges and imagine scaling that up like 100 times, that would be the decoupling completely uh, economically from China. So I think that that's uh, how I frame um, uh, the problem, meaning that now we have so, so much economic interest uh, with China, how do we pull back at least um, to some degree in order to gain the most security uh, in exchange? So that, that's the bargain or that's the balance that we need, we need to strike uh, for policymakers. And your perspective? Yeah, I mean, so well said. Um, so, you know, from the trade e economics angle here, you know, when, uh, and, and actually, you know, 2001, when China acceded to the World Trade Organization, I was, I think I was at TR, yeah. and there was, you know, the, the real belief and hope, but the real sincere belief was that, you know, by, by supporting China's accession to the World Trade Organization, we would be, you know, sort of, you know, as they come into the world economy, they would liberalize, they would open up, become more democratic um, oriented, um, and encourage, that would encourage economic freedom, right? Um, and we were well aware of these forced labor issues in 2001. I mean, all the way back to 1991, I would argue. Um, the, uh, even the uh, Bush one uh, administration uh, was well aware. But, um, and you know, and, and if you go back to the transcripts of, of the deliberations for China's accession, at least uh, on the US side, you'll see a lot of discussions about you know, how can we support China's accession to the World Trade Organization, this large country that uh, facilitates so much forced labor? You know, how can we ethically do that? Not to mention, it's going to kill us on, on the wage uh, side and, and um, you know, trading, opening up to, to trade with a large country that's abundant in low-cost labor. Um, and so all those goods that use, uh, that use labor intensively you know, we would basically be uh, facing intense import competition and then hence face intense disruption. And yes, that is what happened. Um, and so, um, but at the same time, you know, the argument that went out was, well, it's still the right thing to do. You know, they should be part of the world economy. We have to support, you know, their economic freedom, their liberalization. And by all accounts, they were, you know, the, the Chinese negotiators were, um, were saying that was their plan. Right. So, um, you know, fast forward to today and well, you only really have to fast forward to 2008 to see they took a big U-turn on that. Um, and that's not really how things turned out. Um, and then going back to the forced labor, you know, at, in, in economics, we like to I, I like to look at it like, you know, what China sort of you know, got online or joined the economy through the World Trade Organization. Um, you can almost see it as like they, they pushed the, the supply curve, like they literally shifted the supply curve out, not only of labor, but of, of just about, I mean, so many um, commodities and, and goods, right? So, um, and, and now we know it, that a, 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 a non-trivial portion of that is likely due to forced labor. Um, and that is, I think, a real, and when you really let yourself think about that, you know, that, that's really hard as a human being to, um, to, to swallow, you know, um, the, um, and Halloween is approaching and, you know, it just reminds me of, um, the story by, uh, Sue Yi, right? Mm -hmm. Um, this, um, Chinese engineer turned political prisoner who, um, he was, you know, really kind of suffering back pain and he, he found, uh, what was that? Like Tai Chi, he found, you know, he found mm -hmm. Tai Chi and that just happened to be part of this other like meditation movement or something. Well, anyway, what was it called? Uh, Falun Gong. It's Fal like yeah. a 
semi-religious uh, organization yeah. or group. Yeah. Well, the Chinese Communist Party does, does not like that. They don't like organized religion. Um, and you know, he really only started it to help his back problem. You know, he he wasn't even that interested in the you know religion part. But then, but then he grew to enjoy meditation. And um, well, anyway, he uh, one, one thing led to another, and he got wrapped up into a, a sweep and um, ended up in a prison labor camp. And after many years of torture, <coughs> um, uh, brutal torture, um, he he um, one of his notes that he wrote, like an SOS note, showed up in a Halloween package that a mom in Oregon opened up. And and she at first she didn't know what to make of this, like this note, you know, basically please help us, you know. Product for you, you know, are, are were forced to be here against their own will and were tortured. And she took it to the press, and you know, after a few years, it kind of bubbled up, and um, and now it's very well known, and there's a book on it, and um, and but Amelia Peng, this investigative journalist, wrote a whole story about it called Made in China, and it's uh, through his lens, it's fascinating, um, and yeah, I mean, ever since I, you know. Um, you can't, whenever I buy something at the store, you know, sometimes I do look to see where it was made from. But, you know, it, it's hard, though. Um, you know, just because it says made in China, well, was it made with forced labor or not? How do you know? Um, if, if you think it might be, does that mean you shouldn't buy it? You know, most of us are so busy. You know, we just want to get our stuff and get out, at usually at the lowest price possible. I mean, so unless you have more information in front of you, it's really hard to know what to do. Um, and so, um, you know, so when we um, think of the appropriate government response, um, you know, there's a whole range of government responses. One is just to stop trading with China. And as Wei Feng pointed out, that would be disruptive. Um, or, you know, the other is to do nothing. Um, but in terms of, you know, what would be best for the consumers and overall <laughs> welfare and maybe even on the ethics side, um, you know, I think there's a strong argument to be made for just better labeling. Um, and that will put the onus on the manufacturer. Uh, and, but that means they're going to have to do audits that are legit. And it's really hard to do audits in China. The, the Chinese Communist Party does not want people doing audits. Um, and from some of the retailers that I've spoken with off the record, they'll say that, that um, the government will offer them auditors. Um, and, um, you know, so, and sometimes those audits will, you know, at least they can say, based on their best information, it was not made with forced labor, but, um, but it's, um, it's we're really limited in what we can do right now, uh, but I think that's where the answer lies, uh, is in better consumer labeling. How many people in China are engaged in coerced labor? That's a very difficult question. Not because it's logically hard to answer, it's just we don't have uh, a, a lot of information. Uh, according to the estimates, I've seen anywhere from hundreds of thousands to perhaps a few millions. And uh, the range is not only because of the lack of information, but for example, there's a very uh, excellent uh, BuzzFeed report uh, last year, this year. Uh, they counted that, uh, they, they use satellite images to, to identify the like, compounds and to identify whether they are uh, uh, forced labor camps by judging, judging by whether there's groups of people walking in the same color without swinging their arms, for example. So you can uh, identify that from um, satellite images. And they identify that the, the, uh, the facilities they, they know uh, has the capabilities to house um, uh, over a million uh, people. Now, you don't know the turnaround, like how many, how, how long do they stay there. So uh, in terms of scale, that's uh, anywhere, I guess, uh, up or uh, below, below or above uh, one million, I guess. Are they primarily uh, political prisoners, or is it more complex than that? So, so it's very interesting. I mean, it's a heavy subject, but it's interesting to look back at the, the, the history of forced labor. Uh, I think probably one of the most famous uh, uh, very first uh, member of the forced labor camp is the last emperor of China. We wrote about this in the Discourse oh, yeah. magazine, uh, the article. Uh, the last em uh, emperor of the Qing dynasty somehow was caught by the Russians, and then after the war, the Russians was uh, out of good gesture, sending, out, sending, sending him back to Mao. And Mao wanted to use him because he represents the past, right? And so Mao's idea is that let's reform him 
So if he reforms and he becomes a good person, it shows that socialism is really good stuff. And so they lock him up for, uh, <laughs> uh, I guess, uh, over uh, 20, 10 years, uh, over 20, uh, anywhere between 10 to tw uh, 20 years. He did not confess to his, the, the last emperor did not confess to his war crime until several years in prison. Um, and then during, when, uh, during the time uh, when he was in prison, he had to work for like the matchbox factories, like putting all the boxes together, some, some sort of a simple labor. So we know that this uh, practice, so we're talking about early 1950s, the practice has lasted for a long time, but it really um, escalated because, uh, only very recently, because in the past China was in essential planning. So there's not much goods to, to make anyway, right? So you know, uh, ask the prisoners to do something but that's not the economic scale that we have seen today. The economic scales that we have seen today really uh, started in 2014 um, when President Xi Jinping, uh, when he just took office, he took a trip to Xinjiang, the province, and then there was, around that time, there was a terrorist attack uh, in uh, one of the chain stations uh, or stabbing incidents or bombs or uh, something along the line. There, there are several around the same time. And then the Chinese government designated that as terrorist attacks by um, uh, minority uh, Muslims in the, in the country. And that seemed to have really scared the Chinese president off and because then starting in 2014, he was like, we have to uh, clamp down on all these minority, uh, uh, minorities in China. And that started the whole thing of uh, pulling them in, uh, locking them up. And he also had this economic uh, agenda of poverty alleviation um, to, to eliminate extreme poverty in, in China by 2020 or 2022, uh, he accomplished that. But part of the path of accomplishing that was uh, round up all the minorities uh, who live in Xinjiang or nearby uh, to work in factories. And so to answer Mark, your question, sometimes they're forced but not in camps too. So they're, they're, they're home, and, but they, they just you know, round them up, move them somewhere else to work in the factories. They, they are not necessarily in a labor camp. Mm. So if you talk about the, the force uh, not working, not at will, that number is much larger than the people actually in the concentration camps. And are persons imprisoned uh, for religious reasons a large component of forced labor? It seems now it is. So um, the example Christine said, that the, the practice of the semi-religion uh, thing, that was uh, around late 1990s, early two, 2000s. Um, so that was the first wave. Um, it, they had, um, so the Chinese government locked them up because those group of people, they started to protest. They gather in front of uh, where the Chinese presidents uh, live. Or, uh, the Falun around. Gong. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So they, so they gather in Beijing and then a lot of people gathering. And that's also uh, put a lot of uh, uh, pressure on the Chinese government. They are scared of the people gathering in any form, right? And so they started to uh, um, clap, um, crack down on the Falun Gong practitioners. That, but, that, but that was earlier way, but, but now it's more on like people live, who live in Tibet and Xinjiang and in, in the Mongolia. Mm -hmm. Minorities in ethnicity in China also often means minority in religion too. Sure. Yeah. And uh, there's a Christian component to forced labor, I assume. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there any kind of uh, resistance within China to forced labor? Not that much that I know. I know. <laughs> a lot of people just gave up. Um, so very sadly, I, one of my relatives actually was a practitioner of the Falun Gong in late 1990s, early 2000s, late 1990s. When, so when they cracked down on the religious movement, they asked, because they know who, who, whoever is practicing, so they just asked them to sign the letter that says that I swear that I'm not, I'm not going to practice anymore, and then they let you go. It's the people who resist to sign that, who yeah. insist on their freedom. Like soon. Exactly. He didn't, he didn't sign. Right. So those who resisted and tried to fight for their freedom ended up in uh, uh, prison camps. Would your average Chinese even have any idea this is going on? I doubt it. Yeah. I doubt it. There'd be no way to find out. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I think the Chinese, this seems, so I monitor Chinese propaganda uh, for my research purposes. And one of the things I noticed was that they, I mean, they, they have initiatives trying to change people's mind about how people view uh, forced labor but it's more targeted on foreign audience, people who can actually see the, what's going on, right? And so they have initiatives of like inviting foreign journalists to please come to Xinjiang and we'll show you around and it's all looking nice. You won't be able to see any prisoners on the street. Mm. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but some journalists did go. So, so one of the, I think one of the uh, transparency issues here is that a lot of, uh, you see a lot of reporting around, but you don't really know uh, because there are some programs, uh, journalism exchange programs in China. They just got 
uh, journalists who, who work in, say, Hong Kong, mm -hmm. Taiwan, Singapore, uh, anywhere else in the world. They try to get them here and then treat them nicely. See, there are no uh, forced labor. And then maybe they go back and they write something differently. And mm -hmm. we, as consumers of the news, we, we never find out. Mm. Looking back, there's some who say, well, the U.S. should have worked to um, prevent China's integration into the global economy. But was that ever plausible or realistic 20 years ago? Yeah, you know, you do the mental gymnastics on that. And, you know, everyone at the time made the best decision at the time with the information they had at the time. I mean, I really do believe that. Uh, you know, I was in interagency meetings. I mean, th there was a real uh, desire to to bring China into the world economy um, and to, which everyone thought would facilitate um, further economic reform and liberalization in in China. So all the things that the U.S. had wanted for China was seen that, well, the WTO session was a way to get there. So, um, you know, but it, they, it didn't come easy for China. I mean, they, uh, the negotiations were very long, you know, mainly under the Clinton administration. Um, and you can read the um, notes of Charlene Barczewski's uh, discussions with the Chinese. It was quite laborious. She was a very tough negotiator. And uh, Clinton actually wanted it to kind of happen sooner than it did. But, um, you know, USTR was, I mean, they were very methodical about, um, you know, getting China to agree to certain things. Um, but I mean, it's it's really hard to, to imagine how um, you know we would not have supported China's accession. You know, how could you not support you know, twenty percent of the world's economy, right? Um, you know, wanting to come into the to the you know, world world trading system. You know, it, um, and here they were ready and willing to you know to start reforms. They had already got, undergone some reforms, uh, wanting to do more reforms, wanting to open up. Uh, so it it was. It's hard to imagine at that time saying no to that after going through such rigorous deliberations, in my, in my opinion. And uh, before we go to questions from the audience, uh, is there any single uh, clear-cut policy the U.S. could adopt that would have a direct impact on coerced labor in China, or is it so complex, you really, there's no single U.S. policy that really could take it, take it on? So we wrote about an idea in the piece uh, about tracking uh, origins of products. Technically, I think that's a promising way. But it's, you, you need people who are on the ground in China to actually cooperate, right? To lock this, uh, this thing travels from this city to that city, from this facility to that facility. Nobody in China is going to do that for, for us, right? For our benefit uh, while taking the cost or taking the hit from the Chinese government. So I think, te I mean, technically, there's a good way, but it's not politically quite feasible. And I, I guess the, you, there, there are also some relatively clean-cut um, proposals, for example, to ban all the goods coming from Xinjiang. Now, we can debate about how effective it is. I think it's quite a clean-cut uh, solution. Uh, it, it would mean banning everything that was produced uh, from that province, assuming that it has forced labor until the importers can prove, or the exporter importer can prove, that down, deep down in our supply chains, we are still fine. We mm -hmm. looked into it, we are fine, right? Unless they can prove that you you have to uh, uh, you, you cannot enter the U.S. market, and but I, but I think even that uh, it, it could be uh, overdoing it in some way in some sense and underdoing it in other sense, meaning that there are a lot of goods in, in Xinjiang that, that doesn't have, that are not made with forced labor, right? And it may not be an easy task to actually prove it. So for those, then the, uh, they will be suffering the cost. What's and, the population of that province? Uh, the Xinjiang province. Mm -hmm. I actually don't know. <laughs> That's a very good question. But I, I think, I don't remember, I should say, but I did the back of envelope calculation, assuming that if they locked up 2 million people, that's about 20%. So I guess it's probably closer to uh, 10 million. Mm -hmm. um, so the scale is, uh, in, in Xinjiang, is about 20% of uh, concentration mm -hmm. uh, rate. And so they're not necessarily in uh, facilities, right? So the goods coming from Xinjiang may not have for labor. And the, another issue is actually about 10% of the people who are in concentration camps in Xinjiang, they are transported uh, very frequently to uh, elsewhere in China to work for factories that ended up uh, being a supplier to a lot, a lot of global brands that we know. Uh, Christine and I uh, read that a report from an Australian think tank called uh, Labor's uh, Uyghurs for Sale. Mm -hmm. And so they identified about 83 global brands that we consume, including Google, Apple, and everything else that in their supply chain, one of their suppliers are identified in uh, using satellite images as uh, be, uh, being involved in, uh, with one of those uh, facilities. And so 
what do you do about that, right? So it's very hard because they are elsewhere. They're not in the province. So even if you, if you ban the province, the goods from that province, they might still be working in one of those camps outside. And so it, in, in that sense, you could also be underdoing it even with a clean cut policy. Yeah, remember um, the, that CBS um, 60 Minutes show years ago when um, who was Ed Bradley and uh, Tim or somebody Wu went over to China and posed as businessmen um, and said that they wanted to, um, you know, to, to, it was like some office product. And um, they had business cards, you know, they posed from, as they were from the Western um, office product company. Um, and they asked about, you know, forced labor. We're like, oh, well, gee, if it's, um, you know, if it's coming from forced labor, then we can't do it. And the guy said, yeah, but don't worry about that. We, can, we just um, send it to an import exporter and you can buy it from them. So it won't show up, right? So, I mean, they have so many ways of skirting around. Um, even when cases show up, um, in you know, in, um, in anti-dumping countervailing duty, love it or hate it, um, they, these cases often do show up there um, because you'll find you know widget, um, you know, fill in the blank. There's you know dozens and dozens of products. Um, it's not just steel that show up in anti-dumping countervailing duty cases um, where they're underselling not only the U.S. Supp uh, supplier but they're all their other foreign um, competitors by huge margins. And the only way they could um, do that is with you know zero cost labor basically right um, and um, in fact Wu who worked with the CBS uh, 60 Minutes um, at his own uh, danger he um, he actually he followed this it was um, you know those like binder clips that you use like to bind stack of papers so it was these products that he was trying to buy and he um, he went he followed the trucks. Um, back to the original and sure enough they were coming from a prison labor factory right and what they did is they first they like they brought like two big shipments one was just of the, the black part and the other one was of the the you know, the, sil the silver part um and um so he actually he got out of his um his van and went to take pictures of it and then followed the van back to um the prison factory prison labor factory um, and got out and actually saw um, some of the workers there, took pictures, and then, then followed the truck back after they were assembled. Um, so, I mean, they, you know, they brought that to customs and commerce and, you know, led to a, a big trade case. Um, and, you know, that, that ended up um, coming to, like, some agreement between U.S. and China on, on language. Um, but, you know, China is very good at, like, agreeing to one thing but then finding ways to get out of it later. So they'll say, well, this, you know, was it a prison camp or was it um, forced labor? We, we rather call it prison camp. And if it's a prison labor camp, well, then compared to your prison labor camps in the U.S., um, you know, we're actually not really doing anything that wrong. You know, and actually, legally speaking, they were, they were right. So, um, the, so they're, they're very good at, like, finding ways, um, you know, to, to get out from under um, various obligations. Questions from the audience? Yes. And do we need everyone to come to the microphone up here, if you don't mind, stepping forward for the benefit of the uh, online audience and subsequent video? Can you define forced labor specifically? Are we talking about just underpaying of people? Do they have a viable alternative? Um, is similar to, I mean, I read the Jungle Book to Sinclair, just like the 1890s in America, where minorities were very much ill-treated by companies and, you know, not paid. You know, like what what is exactly your defined term of forced labor in China? And I'm sorry, could you identify yourself? My also? name is Joel, and I do the piece here. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Um, I, I guess it's hard because so there there's reporting, for example, that. The uh, Chinese government in the region, they lure people in uh, saying that, because they are poor, right? So the, the residents are poor. So they say, we have this job thing, we move you to that place, and then you work in the factory, and they promise a certain wage. And there's reporting of friends or families of those people who have gone and came back, and they said, uh, have gone and come back, and they said, oh, they ended up paying us much less than they promised to. And so is that force? Not really force, but force pre uh, false pretense, right? And uh, you ended up treating them unfairly. So I think the range of the tactics in China is very uh, wide. 
and of course locking them up and then and then force them to work uh, using torture. That's obviously forced labor, right? There's also forced uh, um, job employment programs. So you live in your poor house, government comes in and say, you know, we have to eliminate poverty because that's the Chinese president's initiative. You know, it helps everybody. So you have to come to this place and work and, and this and that. And if you resist, then they have a reason to lock you up. But if you do not, you still go, you get paid. But is it forced? It is forced. So, so it, I think it has a, a range of uh, different type of tactics. And it will be um, having to work um, not at will, I think, is the definition. But there's a lot of ways you can play around that definition. And then there's a clear case of just you know people who pra who practice organized religion, they get swept up, and unless they um, are willing to sign something saying that they promise they're no longer going to be doing that, um, you know they undergo torture, you know, um, and and are forced to work every single day with no uh, no compensation, um, and the torture. I mean, you know, the the reports that have been um, been published. I mean, it's, it's Sunni reports, you know, being um, he describes being hung by his ankles for over 48 hours um, at one point, and you know, and the guards were instructed to, you know, poke under his nails, um, you know, with, you know, with very long, sharp knives. Um, you know, he lost his, he lost all of his nails. Um, you know, his organs really never recovered. I mean, and that was just one time in several um, instances. And then the females. Especially the Falun Gong females, um, there were reports because see the Falun Gong practitioners um, don't smoke or drink alcohol, and so their uh, bodies are you know pretty good shape compared to uh, somebody who might smoke and drink a lot. Um, and so there there were several reports of um, of these Falun Gong pr practitioners being uh, just they were taken for um, for medical examinations um, while they. While they were in forced labor camp or prison labor camp, they would just be said, you know, said, "Oh, come with us. We're going to give you a medical exam for no reason." They, you know, let's one woman uh, who Amelia Payne writes about. She says there was really no reason um, to take me to a medical exam, but all of a sudden I was undergoing all this all this medical examination, and um, it turns out that they were looking for um, organs to harvest, and so this was you know, this was, has ended up in involuntary art, organ harvesting. Um, by people who were just interested in practicing uh, organized religion for the purpose of you know commercial benefits and for the Chinese government to have um, organs on hand for its citizens um, so um, you know, and, and, and you know that's just that just scratches the surface of the horrors that so many people are undergoing another question yes Hi, my name is Jerome. I work in security and agency. Uh, my question is, uh, from your expertise with relation to forced labor, what are some of the challenges for Western countries like the United States to actually deal with this issue with regard to broad security issues? Say, just for example, Taiwan security or islands in the South China Sea. And is it feasible that anything could actually be done? For forced labor? What, what do you mean? Um, just taking a broader picture of the Western like naval freedom strategy mm -hmm. uh, with China. Uh, okay, but then, but how would forced labor come into that though? That's my question. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could argue that it, it wouldn't. I mean, you it, you know, it possibly doesn't come into that um, at all, right? We can these people can be held against their will and. Maybe it doesn't affect our um, our national security. I, I I don't know. I mean, could you argue that it does? I I don't see a um, obvious connection there either. But on I guess one thing I can say as a broader reply uh, response to your question is that I think sometimes for the U.S. administrations, uh, some policy initiatives might be conflicting with each other, and you may not be able to solve them uh, at all at the same time. So forced labor is uh, obviously connected to the green energy uh, initiatives because uh, some manufacturing goods, for example, right, might, um, are made uh, with forced labor, and we don't really know. So if you want to go tough on that, you might actually risk uh, uh, 
uh, not being able to, to push forward your uh, green energy uh, policies that effectively. But if you do the other one, and you might actually allowing some forced labor in at will. So uh, broad, more broadly, I think there, there's this kind of interconnections. There, another way of connection is that uh, where you want to punch because you also have to consider in terms of U.S.-China relations that you don't, you, you may want to pick your battle, so to speak, right? And where, although all these uh, questions are very important, there are some policy areas that we may not have very effective solutions. There might be other areas that we do, and we might want to get um, the most out of it by uh, being tough on China, because you, you, know, you may not be able to do everything at once, or being tough on China on uh, every front. I would, uh, yeah, I, that, I mean, that's a really good question because, <laughs> yeah, in a way, it really doesn't. Um, and, and how, you know, how important is this to our, to us? You know, can we sleep at night knowing this is happening? You know, I mean, maybe we can, maybe we can't, but if we can't, how much are we willing to give up for it, right? Not only just money and out of pocket, but, um, but like Wei Feng was saying, I mean, we, we need global cooperation on a lot of issues, right? Well, if, you know, if, we offended China with some major um, policy that is going to um, blunt their ability to continue this practice. And then what if they're no longer willing to come to the table and talk to us about things that are really important for the world? I mean, these are really hard questions. Like, but that was a great question. Maybe time for two more questions. Yes. Hi, I'm Jonathan, a lawyer here in DC. Um, and my question is, um, so I wonder, if, would there be a way of trying to address this issue, you know, not just like directly in terms of regulation or, um, you know, trying to target uh, forced labor directly, but more just through um, like looking at how pe individuals are uh, picked up, arrested, tried unjustly, um, tortured unjustly, obviously, you know, in contravention of international you know, human rights agreements and so on. Um, and I wonder if it could be argued that like with uh, other, um, like with the Soviet Union, um, uh, such human rights abuses um, uh, sort of helped show the, um, the regime to be, it, it sort of revealed the character of the regime, right? And so from a PR perspective, I guess, you know, um, would there be a way of so um, so making that case, you know, that um, China would need to change in some way? Um, I, I think that's a that's a great question because uh, I am a strong believer of, of what's called open source intelligence, which is that we can generate a lot of very precious, uh, invaluable intelligence information by just using publicly available data. And on the issue of forced labor, I think satellite images, a lot of investigative journals, they have done amazing work in the last few years, way better in my opinion than the intelligence uh, by the government. That they just look through all these uh, images and identify buildings, compounds, how many floors there are, how many people can they house. And uh, there's one that's very clever, I just read uh, uh, recently, that uh, the way they did, they identified uh, possible suspects of uh, compounds is to overlay the satellite images provided by Chinese companies like Baidu, China's version of Google. So they have a fake Google map, right? And then you overlay that with Google map. And what happens is that for all these sensitive places, uh, the Chinese uh, map would, uh, would blank them. So then you put them together. You know where, the, where to look, right? Because otherwise, who else has the time to look through all the satellite images? And so there are very clever ways of using this kind of data. And I think um, the Policymakers they need to work with the uh, civil society much more than they are now, including working with all these brilliant reporting reporters or scholars, analysts, because they provide uh, uh, tremendously valuable information. You could identify the compounds. Once you do, you know which company runs that compound, and you look up on who owns that company. What uh, you, you can identify the names and uh, who else do they do business with, and you can track down the whole uh, entire network. And, and, and another report that just came out recently by the ESPI, the uh, Australian think tank, was they, they actually uh, look at a lot, of, uh, a lot of official documents in China to identify the officials, name of the officials who are running all these oppression, uh, oppressive regimes. In Xinjiang, they identify all these uh, government entities, hundreds of them. And so then the intelligence communities can have the names, right? And they can figure out 
you know, if you want to sanction them, sanction those people, and that will be one way. It's not going to solve all the problems, but at least it moves us a little faster along. And I think this kind of um, the power of reporting on open source intelligence would also make a, a, um, a big impact in terms of from the PR perspective that you uh, asked. I think that would be uh, that would raise the awareness of the public uh, by a lot. Mm -hmm. Time for one more question. Um, Earl Foot, I uh, live in College Park, um, and related to the statistics about the number of, of the slave labor, et cetera, um, I've read a bit about slavery in other parts of the world, especially India, where it's illegal, but lots of companies practice it. And it, a lot of it involves child labor. Do we have any knowledge about how much child labor, forced labor there is in China? I don't know, do you? I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, like for instance, like a, if, a whole, if an entire Uyghur family uh, was put into a re-education center, if you will, um, you know, I guess the parents would be expected to work, but maybe the children would be expected to go to uh, a school to unlearn their Uyghur education ways camp. and, and yeah, yeah. yeah, an education camp, probably. But, uh, but uh, uh, to your question, I think child labor, isn't that very um, uh, prevalent, uh, uh, prevalent in like chocolate industry? I, I read that the chocolate industry has, uh, they, they, I mean, they, they spend a lot of time trying to get rid of child labor, but somehow it's just hard because all these developing countries, somehow children, they get involved and you can't really trace out them and uh, eliminate them. Mm -hmm. so, so I guess it's, uh, so not, not, to say, not to say all these things are the same as China or it's equally horrible or whatnot, uh, but it's the, the practice in principle, I think, is more widespread than perhaps we thought. And uh, finally, uh, is there any reason, however remotely, to be optimistic that somehow this could reduce as a uh, major problem? I don't know. No. I, <laughs> I have to say, the, I, I am optimistic. So to the extent that I'm optimistic uh, about uh, open source intelligence and providing information, people, regular folks uh, on the internet, they can dig out all the information. For, so from that uh, perspective, I, I'm optimistic, but only how far that could go in terms of solving a problem. Uh, I have my doubts about it too. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm opt I mean, I, I am an optimist by choice. <laughs> um, but, um, but, you know, just civil society actors. I mean, like you guys showing up tonight, like Amelia Payne writing that book, like Sun Yi um, getting a story out and all these people, you know, reading about it and it getting out. You know, recently Pew did a, a global survey of, um, of countries um, in the Indo in Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific region of their view of China, um, and they do this over uh, over the years. And their the view the views of China um, have steadily been declining by its neighbors. <laughs> right? You know, people don't want to be bullied, and they don't want, and they especially don't want to be bullied by someone who treats their people really badly. Right? So the more that this bubbles up through stories like Sunyi or, or, um, or open source intelligence or just pure you know, economic analysis um, and, and, um, and, and more attention by U.S. government. Um, you know, it, it, that means that at ministerial meetings, at government to government meetings, at diplomatic uh, circles, these discussions will be had more and more, right? And it's not gonna happen overnight, but I think I am optimistic that you know, it's, on, it's, it's going in the right direction. On that note, we will conclude. Thank you all for joining this uh, conversation hosted by Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy. Stay tuned for our next event sometime in uh, November. And uh, please applaud our very intelligent and insightful speakers this evening. Thank you. Thank you.